Hello. Welcome again to What Books to Read in World Mythology. Today I'm going to talk about uh, two areas, Finnish and Slavic mythology. This is going to be the last video I'm doing on European mythology, well, at least for now. And uh, basically, uh, the mythology of the Finns uh, have really nothing to do with the mythology of the Slavs. Uh, their, the culture and the language is very different. The mythology is very different. Uh, sometimes uh, Finnish mythology is grouped in with Scandinavian or Norse mythology, but those two mythologies have nothing to do with each other either. Um, so uh, I don't want to make a separate video just for Finnish mythology because there's not too many books on it. So I'm going to start with Finnish mythology. Basically, there's one really, really, really big, great book on uh, on the literature, the mythological literature of the Finns, and that is this book right here. It's called the Kalevala, and uh, it was uh, actually compiled in the 1800s by a guy named Elias Lonrot. And uh, basically, he went around Finland in the 1800s, and he tried and he listened to old songs that people sang, and these were songs of old legends. And he wrote it all down, and he wrote it down in such a way that he made a connected story. So he thought at the time he was putting together a lost, great epic. Today, I don't think these stories were ever really are seen as ever really connected but it doesn't matter it, it seems to form a pretty good connected whole and we have this epic uh, this epic is very important to the to the mindset of the Finns it, it, it has a lot to do with the national identity uh, it inspired the great uh, composer from Finland Jean Sibelius to compose a lot of his a lot of his music was inspired by the Kalevala such as the Swan of Tuonela and uh, the daughter of of uh, Northland also known as Poyola's daughter um, and uh, it's amazing how different this translation by the way is by Keith Bosley and uh, uh, it's very different from other mythologies in the sense that you don't hear of the, the the hero isn't some young guy with a big sword uh the the there's several heroes but the major hero is uh, is an old wizard uh, which is this guy right here and uh he was born old and he's constantly fighting against his nemesis the witch lohi and uh this is a very unusual epic you'll, you'll never read anything like it and it's truly wonderful i have another version here this is an older version. This, uh, it's the Kalevala, or as it's also called, Poems of the Kaleva District. And here's the compiler, the original compiler of the 1800s, Elias Lonrod. He really didn't write it. He just sort of wrote down all the songs that he heard, and then he, and then he put it together in one big book. And this translation is by Magoon. This is a, a, a prose translation. Uh, this is older. There's a lot more information about the Kalevala than the other book that I showed you, but uh, this translation is a little more elegant, I think. Uh, there is a companion book that was also written by Elias Lonrat uh, called this, the, the Cantiletar. I'm not sure how to pronounce that but that's the best I can do. It's published by World's Classics, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it was meant to be a companion to the Kalevala, but there's less mythology in here. There's a little bit, but it's mostly about uh, home life in, in Finland and, and uh, stuff. So, you know, if you want to read more after reading the Kalevala, you could always pick this one up. But the Kalevala is the main book. Okay, now, moving on to Slavic mythology. Uh, Slavic mythology uh, actually is mostly Russian mythology, uh, but uh, but there's other areas, too, that we we have stories from, you know, uh, such as the Serbs and the Poles and uh, the Polish people. And uh, so, basically, I'm going to mention a few books on those. And... Uh, uh, okay, the first one I'm going. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna start with uh, Russian mythology first. Uh, now, Russian mythology, like other European mythologies, there's several. Uh, there's several areas. There, there's usually the myth, which is the myths, which are basically old stories of gods and goddesses, uh, according to one definition of myth. Uh, then there's the, the the legends, which have to do with uh, stories of great heroes, and finally there's the folk tale, which has a lot to do with uh, you know the. the tales of a young person and he has animal helpers and these these stories tend to be shorter and lighter and uh, you know, uh, 
when it comes to when it comes to Russia, there's there's a lot less written. Uh, we know we know about the gods. We we have their names. We we know a thing or two about what how they were worshipped. But there's not too many stories about them. There's more stories about uh, their hero legends, and finally their folk tales. They have a, a ton of them. Um, I'm in these videos. I've been I've been trying to focus more on mythology, more on gods and heroes that were once worshipped at the time. Um, so I'm going to focus on that. However, when it comes to Russian mythology, uh, maybe Slavic mythology as as a whole, it's it, it's hard to get away from the folk tale. It's always mixed in there. So a lot of the books I'm going to show you is going to have a little bit of all three. Uh, but there isn't any one book I'm going to show you that is going to be ma mainly the folk tales. Uh, so uh, the first book I'm going to show you is uh, is this book here. This one this one actually is very good. It's part of the legendary past, and it's. Uh, it's uh, it's it's simply called Russian Myths, and it's by Elizabeth Warner, and it's it's a slim little book, and it's very thorough. It gives you a little bit of all the stuff that you know the gods that were worshipped in Russia at one time, and other spirits, and house spirits, and fairy spirits, and uh, uh, thoughts of the dead, and uh, hero stuff. So this little book has a little bit of of everything, and it's very concise and very neat. It has a story or two, but it's uh, it's not story heavy. It's more about the the gods and the beliefs at one time, but it's still a very good book. A, a, another book that is a little more uh, uh, heavy on, um, uh, a, a little heavier on storytelling and, act, and giving you uh, versions of the stories of some of the major stories is this a little interesting book. It's uh, it's called Essential Russian Mythology, so it must be important because it's got essential in the title. And this is a, a book by Simonov, a person by the name of Peter Simonov. And uh, this was a great book. He starts off, like like I mentioned, uh, the, the various sections, the mythology, he talks a little bit about the gods. Uh, then the middle part, or maybe the, I forget how it's divided up, but another part is mostly folk tales. Uh, and finally, the third part is mostly legend, legends of old heroes uh, that existed during uh, during Kiev, uh, the time of Kiev, when that was once the, the, the capital of Russia. And uh, so, uh, so this is a great little book. It gives you all three little areas in one little book. And... Uh, and so on. Another book that is uh, is also again heavy with giving you the stories um, uh, rather than analysis is is this interesting, beautiful, beautifully illustrated book by called Heroes, Monsters, and Other Worlds from Russian Mythology, and this is by this is by Elizabeth Warner. Hey, how you like that, Elizabeth Elizabeth Warner, the same person that wrote this book. I didn't even realize that. Um, uh, this cover seems to show the folktale of the Firebird and Gu and Grey Wolf. Again, can't get away from folktales when it comes with Russia, even if you want to treat, try and read about heroes and gods. Um, so uh, this book is 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 beautifully illustrated. I know it looks like a kid's book, but but you'd be surprised. Kids can enjoy it, but it's not insipid enough that adults can't enjoy it. it, it it's actually very very nicely written and. A person of any age can read this, and again, it's got folk tales, it's got legends, it's got the gods, gods and gods and gods and goddesses. Um, uh, the reason why we don't have too many, too many stories of the gods and goddesses, like like we have for Greece, is because according to one theory, there was a. Um, um, what happens is that by the time the the uh, the Russians invented an alphabet where they could the reason why the uh, Cyrillic was invented was so that the the, the Russians and other Slavic speaking peoples can have the Bible in their language because they didn't have a Bible in their in their own language so the Cyrillic alphabet was invented for that but of course by the time people started using the alphabet they were all Christian and uh, so the stories of gods and goddesses kind of never really, I guess, if they existed, weren't written down. Uh, that's according to one theory. I'm not saying that theory is prevalent today. Maybe it's been discarded, and I might be wrong. I don't know. Uh, but we, we know about gods and, and goddesses, but not too many stories about them. So this one goes through gods, uh, but it tells when it comes to storytelling, it's more on legends and folktales. Um, now, finally, uh, for Russia, this is my this is a, a really a, a incredible book. I, it took me a long time to find this. I was hoping there would be a, an English translation coming one day, and and there was. This is called an anthology of Russian folk epics, and the translator is by James James Bailey and Tatiana Ivanova. 
see Tatiana Ivanova. And this book is really great, okay, because, um, see, uh, when it comes to Russian beliefs, uh, the folktale is usually called uh, skazka, plural would be skazki. I'm more interested in myth and legends, and the legends were are sometimes referred to as uh, Bellini. Uh, uh, Bellini are these are these uh, are, are these legends, the, these little epics that are uh, unlike the Iliad, which is a long ep epic. The Russian epic is short. That there's a lot of little short epics written in poetry, written in verse form, and they tell of such heroes as Fiatogar and Dobrynya and Ilya and Alyosha and other other of these figures that were believed to be around the time of uh, King Vladimir when he ruled Kiev. Um, and uh, and uh, these are my favorite stories, uh, since epic is my favorite uh, uh, way that mythology is conveyed is usually in the form of the epic. And uh, so these are my favorite Russian stories. These are great. Th these stories are not easy to find. Uh, this book is not easy to find. Uh, it's uh, I, I found it by accident. Uh, however, there are other Russian books you may come across that if it's not exactly this one, it, it might have uh, it, it'll it'll include definitely some some of these hero legends. Like for example, this book, this book that I just showed you. If you can't find this book, at least there's some of those in this book too. So, like I said, when it comes to general books on Russian mythology, it tends to combine all these different areas. But this book, particularly, is just the epics. It doesn't have folk tales. It doesn't have anything about the old gods. At least I don't remember it did. But this is great. This is this is epic poetry of of the Russians. Um, okay, there's one more. Now there's another book moving out of Russia and moving into Slavic mythology in general. Uh, but still, it includes some Russia. Uh, it includes Russia. It's this very interesting book by Time Life Books. It's part of a series called Myth and Mankind, and this one is called Forest of the Vampire. And the little inset here says Slavic myth. This is a series by Time Life Books where they cover different mythologies, and this one's on Slavic myth. This book is really great because it talks about Russia, it talks about other uh, Slavic-speaking cultures, and uh, and it talks. Uh, it, it's very general. It it, it talks about all, all kinds of beliefs that. The, uh, the, the Slavs, uh, uh, the Russians, and other Slavic speakers have, and uh, and uh, it talks about the, the gods and it talks about the different spirits they believed in, and it tells uh, one, it tells a few stories. What what I find funny about this book is there's a picture of uh, Vlad the Impaler on the cover, which of course was uh, Bram, you know, Bram Stoker's Dracula is based on this character, and it's it's funny because. Uh, uh, he was once a king of Romania, and Romanians don't, they're not a Slavic-speaking people. A Romanian is a, is a Romance language, so it's funny that he's here. Uh, I guess the reason why he's included is because he's such a recognizable figure. And uh, and you have to remember that uh, uh, Romania is situated among Slavic-speaking countries, and s these these countries have a lot of a lot of belief in vampires and werewolves and and stuff like that so if you're going to have a book on that includes about werewolves and vampires you got to stick him on the cover i guess but I, I think it's a little unfair you know because to this day the romanian people you know really don't see vlad as any kind of scary dracula or vampire he's actually considered a national hero he kept romania safe from the turks even though he was rather ruthless um uh, okay so this book is pretty good um okay now moving out of Russia and finally get into getting into other uh, areas. Uh, I have a few other books on on the mythology of the Slavs that are, is not Russia. I have this great book that was published by uh, was it? No, I don't know. Um, oh, I thought it was Dover, but it's not. Uh, okay, uh, this book is great. It's it's uh, Hero Tales, Hero Tales and Legends of the Serbians, and this is great. The Serb, this is this is just one book. It's not too many books out there just on the Serbians, but this is a great book. It it tells it, it's by uh, Petrovic, see Petrovic, and this is an old collection of 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 really great. Uh, legends and folk tales and myths of uh, of the Serbians and uh, uh, and they include uh, it, it might be it's old it might be a little outdated but it also includes uh, stories of their main hero by the name of Marco uh, don't say Polo please uh, uh, it's not that Marco uh, but uh, uh, but 
it, this is really good. Uh, the reason why I mentioned Marco is because after I found this one, I tracked down this book, which is really good, called Marco the Prince, uh, translated by Anne Pennington and Peter Levy. Uh, the reason why I, I really wanted to uh, to get this book is because I was really interested in the hero legends here in this book. Now, this book had more of a retelling and a synopsis of the stories of Marco, among other things. And I wanted to I wanted to actually read an English translation of the original story. So I got this book. And this book is great. If you're interested in in, in the epic literature and the legends of the Serbians, this book is great. It's a, it's a translation of just this one hero. Uh, uh, of course, the heroics are very different than um, than the actual figure that actually lived, but that's besides the point. So this book is great. This book is 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 uh, it, it should be talked about more uh, when it comes to world epic. Um, and finally, one more book. I, I found many years ago this beautiful little book called. Uh, on, uh, just on Polish mythology, uh, old Polish legends. Um, this is a, not a translation. It's retold by a guy named Anstruther, F. C. Anstruther, and this book. I, I it's a thin little, thin little, beautiful little book, and uh, and it tells some really, and it's even illustrated. It tells some really great stories. Uh, uh, central stories of, uh, of old Poland. It talks about the founding of Poland, uh, uh, of, of, uh, or one of the cities of Poland, I forgot. Uh, yeah, and uh, so this is a, again, nice little addition to your collection of Slavic mythology. Okay, so that's it for today, and until next time, happy reading.